Happy 4th of July special from Amygdala Vids. Hopefully you're all out there grilling, having a barbecue, shooting guns, petting your bald eagle. But today as a philosophy channel, we get to celebrate America by talking about American philosophy. And I mean American philosophy is often overlooked in the whole, wait, 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 you know it's not the 4th of July yet, right? You're almost a whole month early. I mean, come on, you can't expect me to know what date the 4th of July is on, right? So welcome back to Amygdala Vids, the channel with the most physically attractive subscribers. And speaking of physical attraction, in this video we're going to be going over William James and his essay The Will to Believe, which concerns questions of faith, truth, risk, and evidence. And you'll want to stick with me till the end of the video because I found out something insane about William James that blew me away and you don't want to miss that. So before we get into the specifics of the essay, I think it's helpful to get the overall goal for James for this essay. Keep in mind that, like many of James's essays, this was given as a lecture. I have brought with me tonight something like a sermon on justification by faith to read to you. I mean an essay in justification of faith, a defense of our right to adopt a believing attitude in religious matters, in spite of the fact that our merely logical intellect may not have been coerced. So James is going to justify a belief in religious matters. As we go through the different parts of the essay, we'll eventually return to this overall goal to see how it all fits together and see if it's convincing to you. As always, commenting your thoughts below is going to help everyone make up their mind, so that's highly encouraged. Unless you're a bot trying to comment a link for sexytime.com which will destroy my computer. But with that out of the way, let's start with our discussion of options. Every student of philosophy must do this one thing, cry themselves to sleep due to confusion. But also, we have to make choices regarding our beliefs and our actions. But there are many choices in life, from should I get pepperoni or no pepperoni on my pizza, to should I believe in free will or determinism. Options for James consist of two hypotheses or proposed beliefs. So the option blue or red consists of the hypothesis blue or the hypothesis red. Some options to James, however, are genuine options, options that we must decide on and that are important. Now in order for an option to be genuine, it must pass through a series of tests. I've illustrated this gauntlet here to help explain it. As you can see, there are three tests that your option must go through to be genuine. It must be living rather than dead, forced rather than avoidable, and momentous rather than trivial. Don't worry, we'll go through these each one at a time. Starting with this first test of living or dead, an option is living if both the hypotheses are something you could see yourself possibly believing. A live hypothesis is one which appeals as a real possibility to him to whom it is proposed. As an example, James is talking to a room full of Protestants and recognizes that the Mahdi, an Islamic religious figure, is probably not a possible belief for them. Therefore, for the Protestants in the room, it's probably a dead hypothesis. The belief in the divinity of Christ for them, however, is a live hypothesis. Here's my example. I could see myself believing that me and my friends are going to watch a movie tonight. Therefore, that's a live hypothesis. I don't see myself believing that my Hyundai Sonata was somehow replaced by a circus elephant. Therefore, that would be a dead hypothesis. As you can see, this is pretty subjective and based upon the world you personally grew up in. Now both your hypotheses have to be living for you to pass this gate. In terms of faith, you must see yourself possibly believing that God exists and that God doesn't exist. Those both have to be living hypotheses for you to continue and for this essay to really have much relevance to you. So if you're a hardcore atheist that won't entertain the idea that some divinity exists, then we can't pass this test and this essay won't have much value for you. But assuming we're all on board here with believing or not believing in the divine to be living hypotheses, we could then move on to the next test of forced or avoidable. Now this one's more straightforward. An option is forced if you must choose, and is avoidable if you don't have to choose. If I say, either love me or hate me, your option is avoidable. You may remain indifferent to me, neither loving or hating. But if I say, either accept this truth or go without it, I put on you a forced option, for there is no standing place outside of the alternative. Every dilemma based upon a complete logical disjunction, with no possibility of not choosing, is an option of this forced kind. So like I was saying, this option is pretty straightforward. Just use your imagination and try to think of a way out. And if you can't, then it's a forced option. 
Since this is a packed essay, I'll just move on. But if you don't get it fully, then say something in the comments and I'll try to help. Now in relation to faith, this is a forced option. Either believe in the divine or don't. But one may say, can't I just be agnostic? Isn't that an escape? The thing is, practically, withholding judgment and not believing are going to yield the same practical consequences. That's not to say they're totally the same. But if you go to an amusement park and your friends want you to ride a roller coaster, saying eh, I don't know, and just being indecisive is going to result in the same thing as just saying no. Finally, we get to the last test, the momentous versus trivial, where only the momentous options will pass. Here's how James describes a trivial option, and from this we could easily deduce what a momentous option is. The option is trivial when the opportunity is not unique, when the stake is insignificant, or when the decision is reversible if it later prove unwise. For the purposes of faith, the stake is extremely significant not just in terms of the afterlife, but faith can have large effects on us while we're living as well. So as you can see, the question of believing in the divine versus not believing passes all these tests, making it a genuine option. What then comes next? Now with this genuine option, we could use our willing, passional nature to decide upon the two options. But what is this willing nature? When I say willing nature, I do not mean only such deliberate volitions as may have set up habits of belief that we cannot now escape from. I mean all such factors of belief as fear and hope, prejudice and passion, imitation and partisanship, the circumpressure of our caste and set. As a matter of fact, we find ourselves believing we hardly know how or why. This might seem very out there, basing beliefs upon these emotions such as fear and hope, but two important factors apply. Cause you know we can't just believe whatever we want willy nilly based on emotions. First it has to pass the genuine option test. This is important for a lot of reasons but mainly the living versus dead hypothesis question. James actually critiques Pascal and Pascal's wager, which is an argument for faith, for trying to force a dead option on people. It is evident that unless there be some pre-existing tendency to believe in masses and holy water, the option offered to the will by Pascal is not a living option. It is only our already dead hypotheses that our willing nature is unable to bring to life again. So that's the first check. The second check comes from a very important quote in section 4 of the lecture. Our passional nature not only lawfully may but must decide an option between propositions, whenever it is a genuine option that cannot by its nature be decided on intellectual grounds. So another check on our willing or passional nature is that it cannot be decided on intellectual grounds. You know Crash Course had a small segment on James and the will to believe, but they claimed that his whole genuine option scheme would support being anti-vax. What's missing however is that the whole vaccination thing can probably be solved on intellectual grounds, unlike the existence of the divine. Now there are other arguments James gives in favor of the power of this willing nature, but this is already a long video and I want to incentivize you guys to actually read the text itself. Alright, now let's take a look at truth and error. There are two ways of looking at our duty in the matter of opinion, ways entirely different and yet ways about whose difference the theory of knowledge seems hitherto to have shown very little concern. We must know the truth, and we must avoid error. These are our first and great commandments as would-be knowers, but they are not two ways of stating an identical commandment. They are two separable laws. Now on first glance, these seem like they are saying the same thing. We must know the truth, and we must avoid error. To demonstrate this difference, William James cites another William, William Kingdom Clifford who James is going to disagree with here. Now Clifford, he takes the we must avoid error approach. Believe nothing, he tells you, keep your mind in suspense forever, rather than by closing it on insufficient evidence incur the awful risk of believing lies. So Clifford is like, look, if there's insufficient evidence for something, don't believe it, or else you'll be in error, and we got to avoid error. This sounds like common sense on the surface, in fact, it sounds like the position of a knowledgeable mind. But being in error, or being duped as James calls it, is sometimes necessary for our own pursuit of the truth. It is like a general informing his soldiers that it is better to keep out of battle forever than to risk a single wound. Not so are victories either over enemies or over nature gained. Our errors are surely not such awfully solemn things. In a world where we are so certain to incur them in spite of all our caution, 
A certain lightness of heart seems healthier than this excessive nervousness on their behalf. So James is like, look, Clifford, Big Red Dog, if you're after the truth in this world, you're gonna be wrong sometimes, I mean it's inevitable. So instead of having this anxiety over being wrong, just try to live with it. And I mean that doesn't mean celebrate being wrong, but instead try to be content with it on the journey to truth. In the quote, James uses the example of soldiers, but a better example I think is that whole idea of Thomas Edison failing 10,000 times before inventing the light bulb. Now that we find ourselves in favor of knowing the truth as opposed to avoiding error, we can now really get in depth with religion. So just to recap before this part, the question of believing in the divine or not is a genuine option and one that cannot be decided on intellectual grounds. Therefore, we could use our willing or passionate nature to choose between the hypotheses. Also, we find ourselves in favor of knowing the truth as opposed to avoiding error. Alright, recap complete. So to help our passionate nature decide upon these two hypotheses, let's look to see what religion even is. Religion says essentially two things. First, she says the best things are the more eternal things, the overlapping things, the things in the universe that throw the last stone, so to speak, and say the final word. The second affirmation is that we are better off even now if we believe her first affirmation to be true. Now this is still up for debate and I'll let y'all hash it out in the comments, but assuming religion can better ourselves even now, this is definitely going to appeal to our passionate, willing nature. Okay, okay, I've heard it all before, all these psychological benefits of religion and all that. Plus an afterlife might be pretty dope, but what about truth? How does this whole knowing truth versus avoiding error thing come into play? Well this is where James talks about something being known true to you if you meet halfway and believe. Do you like me or not, for example? Whether you do or not depends in countless instances on whether I meet you halfway, am willing to assume that you must like me, and show you trust and expectation. The previous faith on my part in your liking's existence is in such cases what makes your liking come. But if I stand aloof and refuse to budge an inch until I have objective evidence, until you shall have done something apt, as the absolutists say, ten to one, your liking never comes. So James is saying that sometimes for something to be revealed as true to you, you gotta make this leap of faith. This assumption that the thing is true in order to see it. I said this in my last video on Stoicism, where just assuming Stoicism to be true has shown me some practical benefits of putting it into action. And there's a lot of examples of this where a desired result is dependent upon the faith of people. James uses the examples of government, the army, the economy, colleges, sports teams, and even science. These are, then, cases where a fact cannot come at all unless a preliminary faith exists in its coming. Now this idea kind of blew my mind when I first read it and applied it to religious faith. James is talking a bit more generally here about meeting halfway, but we could recognize certain religions in which you need to believe in order to come into contact with the divine. And if we're all about knowing the truth, even if we risk being wrong, then it makes sense to believe because it means we have a chance of realizing that truth or coming into contact with the divine. It's almost like buying a lottery ticket for truth. An agnostic or atheist isn't able to play and therefore loses out on an opportunity for truth. A believer, they could be wrong, sure, but if they value truth, then they're willing to risk being wrong because the belief would be a requirement for discovering truth. Hopefully I made that clear, probably not, I don't know. Now some of you are probably asking which god, which religion, similar arguments to Pascal's wager. And I think James would return to the whole living hypothesis thing. We all grow up in different cultures and backgrounds and some religions seem more of a living hypothesis than others. To me, a Protestant Christian belief is more of a living hypothesis to me than a Hindu belief. Not necessarily because of the differences in those beliefs, but more about how and where I grew up. And with that, James attempts a justification for religious faith in the absence of sufficient evidence. James ends this lecture with a quote by Fitz James Stephen, which really ties the whole thing up in a poetic fashion. We stand on a mountain pass in the midst of whirling snow and blinding mist, through which we get glimpses now and then of paths which may be deceptive. If we stand still, we shall be frozen to death. If we take the wrong road, we shall be dashed to pieces. We do not certainly know whether there is any right one. What must we do? Be strong and of good courage. Act for the best, hope for the best, and take whatever comes. If death ends all, we cannot meet death better. 
And there you have it. This would have been a cool lecture to actually listen to. This obviously wasn't the most in-depth analysis, but I hope to get the basic points down. For a more in-depth analysis, check out Dr. Gregory Sadler's series on the essay. Thanks for sticking with me till the end, and here is the special surprise. James apparently experimented with many substances in order to discover mystical experiences, and apparently, he was only able to understand Hegel under these substances. If you enjoyed the video, I highly recommend hitting the subscribe button for more of these philosophy videos. And hitting the like button and notification bell also helps support the channel. We obviously talked about a lot of ideas here, so commenting below any thoughts or questions is highly recommended. And as always, I wish you all a beautiful rest of your day.